Section Zero of Under the Greenwood Tree by Thomas Hardy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Under the Greenwood Tree Preface. Under the Greenwood Tree, or The Melstock Choir, a rural painting of the Dutch school by Thomas Hardy. The Preface of 1896. This story of the Melstock Choir and its old established West Gallery musicians, with some supplementary descriptions of similar officials in Two on a Tower, A Few Crusted Characters, and other places, is intended to be a fairly true picture at first hand of the personages, ways, and customs which were common among such orchestral bodies in the villages of fifty or sixty years ago. One is inclined to regret the displacement of these ecclesiastical bandsmen by an isolated organist, often at first a barrel organist or harmonium player. And despite certain advantages in point of control and accomplishments which were no doubt secured by installing the single artist, the change has tended to stultify the professed aims of the clergy its direct result being to curtail and extinguish the interest of parishioners in church doings. Under the old plan, from half a dozen to ten full-grown players, in addition to the numerous more or less grown-up singers, were officially occupied with the Sunday routine, and concerned in trying their best to make it an artistic outcome of the combined musical taste of the congregation. With a musical executive limited, as it mostly is limited now, to the parson's wife or daughter and the school children, or to the school teacher and the children, an important union of interests has disappeared. The zest of these bygone instrumentalists must have been keen and staying to take them as it did on foot every Sunday after a toilsome week through all weathers to the church which often lay at a distance from their homes. They usually received so little in payment for their performances that their efforts were really a labour of love. In the parish I had in mind when writing the present tale, the gratuities received yearly by the musicians at Christmas were somewhat as follows. From the manor house, ten shillings and a supper. From the vicar, ten shillings. From the farmers, five shillings each. From each cottage household, one shilling, amounting altogether to not more than ten shillings a head annually, just enough, as an old executant told me, to pay for their fiddle strings, repairs, rosin, and music paper, which they mostly ruled themselves. Their music in those days was all in their own manuscript, copied in the evenings after work and their music books were home bound. It was customary to inscribe a few jigs, reels, hornpipes, and ballads in the same book by beginning it at the other end, the insertions being continued from front and back till sacred and secular met together in the middle, often with bizarre effect. The words of some of the songs exhibiting the ancient and broad humour, which our grandfathers, and possibly grandmothers, took delight in, and is in these days unquotable. The aforesaid fiddle-strings, rosin, and music-paper were supplied by a peddler, who travelled exclusively in such wares from parish to parish, coming to each village about every six months. Tales are told of the consternation once caused among the church fiddlers when, on the occasion of their producing a new Christmas anthem, he did not come to time, owing to being snowed up on the downs, and the straits they were in through having to make shift with whipcord and twine for strings. He was generally a musician himself, and sometimes a composer in a small way, bringing his own new tunes and tempting each choir to adopt them for a consideration. Some of these compositions, which now lie before me, with their repetitions of lines, half-lines and half-words, their fugues and their intermediate symphonies, are good singing still, 
though they would hardly be admitted into such hymn-books as are popular in the churches of fashionable society at the present time. August 1896 The Preface of 1912 Under the Greenwood Tree was first brought out in the summer of 1872 in two volumes. The name of the story was originally intended to be, more appropriately, The Melstock Choir, and this has been appended as a subtitle since the early editions, it having been thought unadvisable to displace for it the title by which the book first became known. In rereading the narrative after a long interval, there occurs the inevitable reflection that the realities out of which it was spun were material for another kind of study of this little group of church musicians than is found in the chapters here penned so lightly, even so farcically and flippantly at times. But circumstances would have rendered any aim at a deeper, more essential, more transcendent handling unadvisable at the date of writing. And the exhibition of the Melstock Choir in the following pages must remain the only extant one, except for the few glimpses of that perished band which I have given in verse elsewhere. T. H. April 1912 End of section zero. Recording by Rachel Linton, Bristol, UK. Greenwood Tree. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Under the Greenwood Tree by Thomas Hardy. Beginning of part the first, winter. Chapter one, Melstock Lane. To dwellers in a wood, almost every species of tree has its voice as well as its feature. At the passing of the breeze, the fir trees sob and moan no less distinctly than they rock. The holly whistles as it battles with itself. The ash hisses amid its quiverings. The beech rustles while its flat boughs rise and fall. And winter, which modifies the note of such trees as shed their leaves, does not destroy its individuality. On a cold and starry Christmas Eve, within living memory, a man was passing up a lane towards Melstock Cross, in the darkness of a plantation that whispered thus distinctively to his intelligence. All the evidences of his nature were those afforded by the spirit of his footsteps, which succeeded each other lightly and quickly, and by the liveliness of his voice as he sang in a rural cadence, With the rose and the lily and the daffodown dilly, the lads and the lasses a sheep shearing go. The lonely lane he was following connected one of the hamlets of Melstock Parish with Upper Melstock and Lugate and to his eyes, casually glancing upward, the silver and black-stemmed birches with their characteristic tufts, the pale grey boughs of beech, the dark creviced elm, all appeared now as black and flat outlines upon the sky, wherein the white stars twinkled so vehemently that their flickering seemed like the flapping of wings. Within the woody pass, at a level anything lower than the horizon, all was dark as the grave. The copsewood forming the sides of the bower interlaced its branches so densely, even at this season of the year, that the draught from the northeast flew along the channel with scarcely an interruption from lateral breezes. After passing the plantation and reaching Melstock Cross, the white surface of the lane revealed itself between the dark hedgerows like a ribbon, jagged at the edges the irregularity being caused by temporary accumulations of leaves extending from the ditch on either side. The song, many times interrupted by flitting thoughts which took the place of several bars, and resumed at a point it would have reached had its continuity been unbroken, now received a more palpable check in the shape of Hoy! from the crossing lane to Lower Melstock, on the right of the singer who had just emerged from the trees. Hoy! he answered, stopping and looking round, though with no idea of seeing anything more than imagination pictured. Is that thee, young Dick Dewey? came from the darkness. 
Aye, sure, Michael Mail. Then why not stop for fellow creatures? Go into thy own father's house too, as we be, and knowing us so well. Dick Dewey faced about and continued his tune in an under whistle, implying that the business of his mouth could not be checked at a moment's notice by the placid emotion of friendship. Having come more into the open, he could now be seen rising against the sky, his profile appearing on the light background like the portrait of a gentleman in black cardboard. It assumed the form of a low-crowned hat, an ordinary-shaped nose, an ordinary chin, an ordinary neck, and ordinary shoulders. What he consisted of further down was invisible from lack of sky low enough to picture him on. Shuffling, halting, irregular footsteps of various kinds were now heard coming up the hill, and presently there emerged from the shade severally five men of different ages and gates, all of them working villagers of the parish of Melstock. They too had lost their rotundity with the daylight, and advanced against the sky in flat outlines, which suggested some processional design on Greek or Etruscan pottery. They represented the chief portion of Melstock Parish Choir. The first was a bowed and bent man, who carried a fiddle under his arm, and walked as if engaged in studying some subject connected with the surface of the road. He was Michael Mail, the man who had hallooed to Dick. The next was Mr. Robert Penny, boot and shoemaker, a little man who, though rather round-shouldered, walked as if that fact had not come to his own knowledge, moving on with his back very hollow and his face fixed on the northeast quarter of the heavens before him, so that his lower waistcoat buttons came first, and then the remainder of his figure. His features were invisible, yet when he occasionally looked round, two faint moons of light gleamed for an instant from the precincts of his eyes, denoting that he wore spectacles of a circular form. The third was Elias Spinks, who walked perpendicularly and dramatically. The fourth outline was Joseph Bowman's, who had now no distinctive appearance beyond that of a human being. Finally came a weak, lath-like form, trotting and stumbling along, with one shoulder forward and his head inclined to the left, his arms dangling nervelessly in the wind as if they were empty sleeves. This was Thomas Leaf. "'Where be the boys?' said Dick to this somewhat indifferently matched assembly. The eldest of the group, Michael Mail, cleared his throat from a great depth. "'We told them to keep back at home for a time, thinking they wouldn't be wanted yet a while, and we should choose the two uns and so on.' "'Father and Grandfather William have expected ye a little sooner. "'I've just been for a run round by Yulee's stile and Hollow Hill to warm my feet.' "'To be sure, Father did, to be sure it did expect us, "'to taste the little barrel beyond compare that he's going to tap.' "'Odd rabbit at all! Never heard a word of it,' said Mr. Penny, "'gleams of delight appearing upon his spectacle glasses. "'Dick, meanwhile,' singing parenthetically the lads and the lasses a sheep shearing go neighbours there's time enough to drink a sight of drink afore bedtime said mail true true time enough to get as drunk as lords replied bowman cheerfully this opinion being taken as convincing they all advanced between the varying hedges and the trees dotting them here and there kicking their toes occasionally among the crumpled leaves soon appeared glimmering indications of the few cottages forming the small hamlet of upper melstock for which they were bound whilst the faint sound of church bells ringing a christmas peal could be heard floating over upon the breeze from the direction of longpuddle and weatherbury parishes on the other side of the hills a little wicket admitted them to the garden and they proceeded up the path to dick's house End of section one. Recording by Rachel Linton, Bristol, UK. Wood tree. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Under the Greenwood Tree by Thomas Hardy, Part One, Chapter Two, The Tranters. It was a long, low cottage with a hipped roof of thatch, having dormer windows breaking up into the eaves, a chimney standing in the middle of the ridge, and another at each end. The window shutters were not yet closed, and the fire and candlelight within radiated forth upon the thick bushes of box and laurentinus growing in clumps outside and upon the bare boughs of several codlin trees hanging about in various distorted shapes the result of early training as espaliers combined with careless climbing into their boughs in later years the walls of the dwelling were for the most part covered with creepers though these were rather beaten back from the doorway a feature which was worn and scratched by much passing in and out giving it by day the appearance of an old keyhole light streamed through the cracks and joints of outbuildings a little way from the cottage a sight which nourished a fancy that the purpose of the erection must be rather to veil bright attractions than to shelter unsightly necessaries the noise of a beetle and wedges and the splintering of wood was periodically heard from this direction and at some little distance further a steady regular munching and the occasional scurr of a rope betokened a stable and horses feeding within it the choir stamped severally on the doorstone to shake from their boots any fragment of earth or leaf adhering thereto then entered the house and looked around to survey the condition of things through the open doorway of a small inner room on the right hand of a character between pantry and cellar was dick dewey's father reuben by vocation a tranter or irregular carrier he was a stout florid man about forty years of age who surveyed people up and down when first making their acquaintance and generally smiled at the horizon or other distant object during conversations with friends walking about with a steady sway and turning out his toes very considerably being now occupied in bending over a hogshead that stood in the pantry ready horsed for the process of broaching he did not take the trouble to turn or raise his eyes at the entry of his visitors well knowing by their footsteps that they were the expected old comrades the main room on the left was decked with bunches of holly and other evergreens and from the middle of the beam bisecting the ceiling hung the mistletoe of a size out of all proportion to the room and extending so low that it became necessary for a full-grown person to walk around it in passing or run the risk of entangling his hair this apartment contained mrs dewey the tranter's wife and the four remaining children susan jim bessie and charlie graduating uniformly though at wide stages from the age of sixteen to that of four years the eldest of the series being separated from dick the first-born by a nearly equal interval some circumstance had apparently caused much grief to charlie just previous to the entry of the choir and he had absently taken down a small looking-glass holding it before his face to learn how the human countenance appeared when engaged in crying which survey led him to pause at the various points in each wail that were more than ordinarily striking for a thorough appreciation of the general effect bessie was leaning against a chair and glancing under the plaits about the waist of the plaid frock she wore to notice the original unfaded pattern of the material as there preserved her face bearing an expression of regret that the brightness had passed away from the visible portions. Mrs. Dewey sat in a brown settle by the side of the glowing wood fire, so glowing that with a heedful compression of the lips she would now and then rise and put her hand upon the hams and flitches of bacon lining the chimney to reassure herself that they were not being broiled instead of smoked a misfortune that had been known to happen now and then at christmas time hello my sonnies here you be then said reuben dewey at length 
standing up and blowing forth a vehement gust of breath, "'How the blood do puff up in anybody's head to be sure o' stooping like that! "'I was just going out to gate to hark for ye.' "'He then carefully began to wind a strip of brown paper "'round a brass tap he held in his hand. "'This in the cask here is a drop o' the right sort,' tapping the cask. "'Tis a real drop o' cordial from the best-picked apples, "'sansoms, stubbards, five corners, and such like. "'You do mind the sort, Michael?' "'Michael nodded. "'And there's a sprinkling of they that grow down by the orchard rails, "'streaked ones. "'Rail apples, we'd a call em, "'as tis by the rails they grow and not knowing the right name. "'The water cider from em is as good as most people's best cider is. "'Aye, and of the same make too,' said Bowman. "'It rained when we wrung it out and the water got into it, people will say.' "'But tis only an excuse. "'Watered cider is too common among us.' "'Yes, yes, too common it is,' said Spinks, with an inward sigh, "'whilst his eyes seemed to be looking at the case in an abstract form "'rather than at the scene before him. "'Such poor liquor to make a man's throat feel very melancholy, "'and is a disgrace to the name of stimulant. "'Come in, come in, and draw up to the fire. "'Never mind your shoes.' said mrs dewy seeing that all except dick had paused to wipe them upon the doormat i am glad that you've stepped up along at last and susan you run down to grammar kate's and see if you can borrow some larger candles than these fourteens tommy leaf don't ye be afeard come and sit here in the settle this was addressed to the young man before mentioned consisting chiefly of a human skeleton and a smock frock who was very awkward in his movements, apparently on account of having grown so very fast that before he had had time to get used to his height, he was higher. He, I, replied Leaf, letting his mouth continue to smile for some time after his mind had done smiling, so that his teeth remained in view as the most conspicuous member of his body. Here, Mr. Penny, resumed Mrs. Dewey, you sit in this chair. And how's your daughter, Mrs. Brown, John? Well, I suppose I must say pretty fair. He adjusted his spectacles a quarter of an inch to the right. But she'll be worse before she's better, I believe. Indeed, poor soul. And how many will that make in all? Four or five? Five. They've buried three. Yes, five. "'and she not much more than a maid yet. "'She do know the multiplication tables unmistakable well. "'However, twas to be, and none can gainsay it.' "'Mrs. Dewey resigned Mr. Penny. "'Wonder where your grandfather James is?' "'she inquired of one of the children. "'He said he'd drop in to-night. "'Out in Fuel House with Grandfather William,' said Jimmy. "'Now!' "'Let's see what we can do,' was heard spoken about this time by the tranter, in a private voice to the barrel, beside which he had again established himself, and was stooping to cut away the cork. "'Reuben, don't make such a mess of tap in that barrel as is mostly made in this house,' Mrs. Dewey cried from the fireplace. "'I tap a hundred without wasting more than you do in one.' "'Such a squizzling and squirting job as tis in your hands. "'There, he always was such a clumsy man indoors. "'Aye, aye, I know you'd tap a hundred, beautiful Anne, I know you would. two hundred, perhaps. "'But I can't promise. "'This is an old cask, and the wood's rotted away about the tap-hole. "'The husband of a feller, Sam Lawson, that ever I should call in such, now he's dead and gone, poor heart, took me in completely upon the feet of buying this cask. Rube, says he, I always used to call me plain Rube, poor old heart. Rube, he says, says he, that there cask, Rube, is as good as new. Yes, good as new. Tis a wine hogshead, the best port wine in the Commonwealth, as been in that there cask, and you shall have'n 
for ten shillings, Rube, a said, says he. He's worth twenty, ay, five and twenty if he's worth one, and an iron hoop or two put roundin among the wood ones will make him worth thirty shillings of any man's money if... I think I should have used the eyes that Providence gave me to use afore I paid any ten shillings for a Jim Crack wine barrel. A saint is sinner enough not to be cheated, but tis like all your family was, so easy to be deceived. That's as true as gospel of this member, said Reuben. Mrs. Dewey began a smile at the answer then, altering her lips and refolding them so that it was not a smile, commenced smoothing little Bessie's hair. The tranter, meanwhile, having suddenly become oblivious to conversation, occupying himself in a deliberate cutting and arrangement of some more brown paper for the broaching operation. "'Ah, who can believe sellers?' said old Michael Mail in a carefully cautious voice, by way of tiding over this critical point of affairs. "'No one at all,' said Joseph Bowman, in the tone of a man fully agreeing with everybody. "'Aye,' said Mail, in the tone of a man who did not agree with everybody as a rule, though he did now. "'I knowed a auctioneering feller once, a very friendly feller I was, too.' And so, one hot day, as I was walking down the front street of Casterbridge, just below the King's Arms, I passed open window and see him inside, stuck upon his perch, a selling off. I just nodded to him in a friendly way as I passed, and went my way and thought no more about it. Well, next day, as I was oiling my boots by fuel house door, if a letter didn't come, we a bill charging me with a feather bed, bolster and pillars that I had bid for at Mr. Taylor's sale. The slim-faced martel had knocked him down to me because I nodded to him in my friendly way, and I had to pay for him too. Now, I hold that was coming it very close, Reuben. "'Twas close, there's no denying said the general voice. Too close twas, said Reuben in the rear of the rest. And as to Sam Lawson, poor heart, now he's dead and gone too, I'll warrant that if so be I've spent one hour in making hoops for that barrel, I've spent fifty first and last. That's one of my hoops, touching it with his elbow. That's one of mine. And that, and that, and all these. Ah, Sam was a man, said Mr. Penny contemplatively. Sam was, said Bowman. Especially for a drap of drink, said the tranter. Good, but not religious good, suggested Mr. Penny. The tranter nodded, having at last made the tap and hole quite ready. Now then, Sue's. "'Bring a mug,' he said. "'Here's luck to us, my sonnies.' The tap went in, and the cider immediately squirted out in a horizontal shower over Reuben's hands, knees and leggings, and into the eyes and neck of Charlie, who, having temporarily put off his grief under pressure of more interesting proceedings, was squatting down and blinking near his father. "'There tis again!' said Mrs. Dewey. Devil take the whole, the cask, and Sam Lawson too. That good cider should be wasted like this, exclaimed the tranter. Your thumb, lend me your thumb, Michael. Ram it in here, Michael. I must get a bigger tap, my sonnies. Is it cold inside the hole? inquired Charlie of Michael as he continued in a stooping posture with his thumb in the cork hole. "'What wonderful odds and ends that child has in his head, to be sure!' Mrs. Dewey admiringly exclaimed from the distance. "'I lay a wager that he thinks more about how tis inside that barrel than in all the other parts of the world put together.' 
all persons present put on a speaking countenance of admiration for the cleverness alluded to in the midst of which reuben returned the operation was then satisfactorily performed when michael arose and stretched his head to the extremest fraction of height that his body would allow of to re-straighten his back and shoulders thrusting out his arms and twisting his features to a mass of wrinkles to emphasise the relief acquired a quart or two of the beverage was then brought to table at which all the new arrivals reseated themselves with widespread knees their eyes meditatively seeking out any speck or knot in the board upon which the gaze might precipitate itself whatever is father abiding out in fuel house for so long said the tranter never such a man as father for two things cleaving up old dead apple tree wood and playing the bass viol ud pass his life between the two that a would he stepped to the door and opened it father ay rang thinly from round the corner here's the barrel tapped and we all are waiting a series of dull thuds that had been heard without for some time past now ceased and after the light of a lantern had passed the window and made wheeling rays upon the ceiling inside the eldest of the dewey family appeared end of section two recording by rachel linter in bristol u k wood tree this librivox recording is in the public domain under the greenwood tree by thomas hardy part one chapter three the assembled choir William Dewey, otherwise Grandfather William, was now about seventy, yet an ardent vitality still preserved a warm and roughened bloom upon his face, which reminded gardeners of the sunny side of a ripe ribstone pippin, though a narrow strip of forehead that was protected from the weather by lying above the line of his hat-brim seemed to belong to some town man, so gentlemanly was its whiteness. His was a humorous and kindly nature, not unmixed with a frequent melancholy, and he had a firm religious faith. But to his neighbours he had no character in particular. If they saw him pass by their windows when they had been bottling off old mead, or when they had just been called long-headed men who might do anything in the world if they chose, they thought concerning him, "'Ah, there's that good-hearted man, open as a child!' If they saw him just after losing a shilling or half a crown, or accidentally letting fall a piece of crockery, they thought, There's that poor weak-headed man Dewey again. Ah, he's never done much in the world either. If he passed when fortune neither smiled nor frowned on them, they merely thought him old William Dewey. Ah, so here you be. Ah, Michael and Joseph and John and you too, Leaf. A merry Christmas all. We shall have a rare logwood fire directly, Rube, to reckon by the toughness of the job I had in cleaving em. As he spoke, he threw down an armful of logs, which fell in the chimney corner with a rumble, and looked at them with something of the admiring enmity he would have bestowed on living people who had been very obstinate in holding their own. Come in, Grandfather James. Old James grandfather on the maternal side had simply called as a visitor he lived in a cottage by himself and many people considered him a miser some rather slovenly in his habits he now came forward from behind grandfather william and his stooping figure formed a well illuminated picture as he passed towards the fireplace being by trade a mason he wore a long linen apron reaching almost to his toes corduroy breeches and gaiters which together with his boots graduated in tints of whitish brown by constant friction against lime and stone he also wore a very stiff fustian coat having folds at the elbows and shoulders as unvarying in their arrangement as those in a pair of bellows the ridges and the projecting parts of the coat collectively exhibiting a shade different from that of the hollows, which were lined with small ditch-like accumulations of stone and mortar-dust. 
The extremely large side pockets, sheltered beneath wide flaps, bulged out convexly, whether empty or full, and as he was often engaged to work at buildings far away, his breakfasts and dinners being eaten in a strange chimney corner, by a garden wall, on a heap of stones, or walking along the road, he carried in these pockets a small tin canister of butter, a small canister of sugar, a small canister of tea, a paper of salt and a paper of pepper, the bread, cheese and meat forming the substance of his meals, hanging up behind him in his basket among the hammers and chisels. If a passer-by looked hard at him when he was drawing forth any of these, "'My buttery!' he said with a pinched smile. "'Better try over number seventy-eight before we start, I suppose,' said William, pointing to a heap of old Christmas carol books on a side-table. "'We all my heart,' said the choir generally. Number 78 was always a teaser, always. I can mind him ever since I was growing up a hard boy chap. But he's a good tune and worth a mint of practice, said Michael. He is, though I've been mad enough with that tune at times to season and tear an all to linnet. Aye, he's a splendid carol, there's no denying that. The first line is well enough, said Mr. Spinks, but when you come to, oh, thou man, you make a mess o't. We'll have another go into un and see what we can make of the martel. Half an hour's hammering at un will conquer the toughness of un, I'll warn it. Odd rabbit it all, said Mr. Penny, interrupting with a flash of his spectacles and at the same time clawing at something in the depths of a large side pocket. If so be I hadn't been as scatterbrained and thirtingle as a child, I should have called at the schoolhouse We a boot as I come up along. Whatever is coming to me, I really can't estimate at all. The brain has its weaknesses, murmured Mr. Spinks, waving his head ominously. Mr. Spinks was considered to be a scholar, having once kept a night school and always spoke up to that level. "'Well, I must call with him the first thing to-morrow, and I'll empt my pocket of this last, too, if you don't mind, Mrs. Dewey.' He drew forth a last, and placed it on the table at his elbow. The eyes of three or four followed it. "'Well,' said the shoemaker, seeming to perceive that the interest the object had excited was greater than he had anticipated and warranted the lasts being taken up again and exhibited. Now, whose foot do ye suppose this last was made for? It was made for Geoffrey Day's father over at Yalbury Wood. Ah, many's the pair of boots he've had off that last. Well, when I died, I used the last for Geoffrey, and have ever since, though a little doctoring was wanted to make it do, "'Yes, a very queer-natured last it is now, I believe,' he continued, turning it over caressingly. "'Now, you notice that there,' pointing to a lump of leather bradded to the toe, "'that's a very bad bunion that you've had ever since I was a boy. "'Now, this remarkable large piece,' pointing to a patch nailed to the side, shows a accident he received by the tread of a horse that squashed his foot almost to a pumice. The horseshoe come full butt on this point, you see, and so I've just been over to Geoffrey's to know if he wanted his bunion altered or made bigger in the new pair I'm making. During the latter part of this speech, Mr. Penny's left hand wandered towards the cider cup, as if the hand had no connection with the person speaking, and bringing his sentence to an abrupt close, all but the extreme margin of the bootmaker's face was eclipsed by the circular brim of the vessel. However, I was going to say, continued Penny, putting down the cup, I ought to have called at the school. Here he went groping again in the depths of his pocket, 
to leave this without fail, though I suppose the first thing to-morrow will do. He now drew forth and placed upon the table a boot, small, light, and prettily shaped, upon the heel of which he had been operating. The new schoolmistresses. I, no less Miss Fancy Day, as neat a little figure of fun as ever I see, and just husband high. Never Geoffrey's daughter, Fancy, said Bowman, as all glances present converged like wheel spokes upon the boot in the centre of them. Yes, sure, resumed Mr. Penny, regarding the boot as if that alone were his auditor. "'Tis she that's come here, schoolmistress. "'You knowed his daughter was in training. "'Strange, isn't it, for her to be here Christmas night, Master Penny? "'Yes, but here she is, I believe. "'I know how she comes here, so I do,' chirruped one of the children. "'Why?' Dick inquired with subtle interest. "'Parson Maybold was afraid he couldn't manage us all to-morrow at the dinner.' "'and he talked o' getting her just to come over and help him hand about the plates "'and see we didn't make pigs of ourselves. "'And that's what she's come for.' "'And that's the boot, then,' continued its mender imaginatively, "'that she'll walk to church in to-morrow morning. "'I don't care to mend boots I don't make, "'but there's no knowing what it may lead to, "'and her father always comes to me.' "'There,' between the cider mug and the candle stood this interesting receptacle of the little unknown's foot and a very pretty boot it was a character in fact the flexible bend at the instep the rounded localities of the small nestling toes scratches from careless scampers now forgotten all as repeated in the tell-tale leather evidencing a nature and a bias dick surveyed it with a delicate feeling that he had no right to do so without having first asked the owner of the foot's permission now neighbours though no common eye can see it the shoemaker went on a man in the trade can see the likeness between this boot and that last, although that is so deformed as hardly to recall one of God's creatures, and this is one of as pretty a pair as you get for ten and sixpence in Casterbridge. To you, nothing. But tis father's foot and daughter's foot to me, as plain as houses. I don't doubt there's a likeness, Master Penny, a mild likeness, a fantastical likeness, said Spinks. "'But I ha'n't got imagination enough to see it, perhaps.' "'Mr. Penny adjusted his spectacles. "'Now I'll tell you what happened to me once on this very point. "'You used to know Johnson, the dairyman, William?' "'Aye, sure I did. "'Well, t'wasn't opposite his house, but a little lower down, "'by his paddock in front of Park May's pool.' I was a bearing across towards Bloom End, and lo and behold, there was a man just brought out of the pool, dead. He'd unraid for a dip, but not been able to pitch it just there, had gone in, flop over his head. Men looked at him, women looked at him, children looked at him, nobody knowed him. He was covered with a sheet, but I catch sight of his foot just showing out as they carried him along i don't care what name that man went by i said in my way but he's john woodward's brother i can swear to the family foot at that very moment up comes john woodward weeping and teeving i've lost my brother i've lost my brother only to think of that said mrs dewey "'Tis well enough to know this foot and that foot,' said Mr. Spinks. "'Tis long-headed, in fact, as far as feet do go. "'I know little, tis true, I say no more. "'But show me a man's foot, and I'll tell you that man's heart.' "'You must be a cleverer feller there than mankind in general,' said the tranter. 
"'Well, that's nothing for me to speak of,' returned Mr. Spinks. "'A man lives and learns. Maybe I've read a leaf or two in my time. I don't wish to say anything large, mind you, but nevertheless, maybe I have.' "'Yes, I know,' said Michael soothingly, "'and all the parish knows that ye've read some of everything almost, "'and have been a great filler of young folks' brains. "'Learning's a worthy thing, and ye've got it, Master Spinks. "'I make no boast, though I may have read and thought a little, "'and I know, it may be from much perusing, but I make no boast,' that by the time a man's head is finished, tis almost time for him to creep underground. I am over forty-five. Mr. Spinks emitted a look to signify that if his head was not finished, nobody's head ever could be. Talk of knowing people by their feet, said Reuben. Rot me, my sonnies, then, if I can tell what a man is from all his members put together oftentimes. "'But still, look is a good deal,' observed Grandfather William absently, moving and balancing his head till the tip of Grandfather James's nose was exactly in a right line with William's eye and the mouth of a miniature cavern he was discerning in the fire. "'By the way,' he continued in a fresher voice and looking up, "'that young crater the schoolmistress must be sung to to-night with the rest if her ear is as fine as her face we shall have enough to do to be upsides with her what about her face said young dewey well as to that mr spinks replied tis a face you can hardly gainsay a very good pink face as far as that do go still only a face when all is said and done "'Come, come, Elias Spinks, say she's a pretty maid and have done with her,' said the tranter, again preparing to visit the cider barrel. End of section three. Recording by Rachel Linter in Bristol, UK. Under the Greenwood Tree. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Under the Greenwood Tree by Thomas Hardy. Part one. Chapter four going the rounds. Shortly after ten o'clock the singing boys arrived at the tranter's house, which was invariably the place of meeting, and preparations were made for the start. The older men and musicians wore thick coats with stiff perpendicular collars, and coloured handkerchiefs wound round and round the neck till the end came to hand, over all of which they just showed their ears and noses, like people looking over a wall. The remainder, stalwart ruddy men and boys, were dressed mainly in snow-white smock-frocks, embroidered upon the shoulders and breasts in ornamental forms of hearts, diamonds and zigzags. The cider-mug was emptied for the ninth time, the music-books were arranged, and the pieces finally decided upon. The boys, in the meantime, put the old horn-lanterns in order, cut candles into short lengths to fit the lanterns, and a thin fleece of snow having fallen since the early part of the evening, those who had no leggings went to the stable and wound wisps of hay round their ankles to keep the insidious flakes from the interior of their boots. Melstock was a parish of considerable acreage, the hamlets composing it lying at a much greater distance from each other than is ordinarily the case. Hence, several hours were consumed in playing and singing within hearing of every family, even if but a single air were bestowed on each. There was Lower Melstock, the main village, half a mile from this, with a church and vicarage and a few other houses, the spot being rather lonely now, though in past centuries it had been the most thickly populated quarter of the parish. A mile northeast lay the hamlet of Upper Melstock, where the tranter lived, and at other points knots of cottages, besides solitary farmsteads and dairies. Old William Dewey, with the violoncello, played the bass, his grandson Dick the treble violin, and Reuben and Michael Mayle the tenor and second violins, respectively. 
The singers consisted of four men and seven boys, upon whom devolved the task of carrying and attending to the lanterns, and holding the books open for the players. Directly music was the theme, old William ever and instinctively came to the front. "'Now mind, neighbours," he said, as they all went out one by one at the door, he himself holding it ajar and regarding them with a critical face as they passed, like a shepherd counting out his sheep. "'You two counterboys, keep your ears open to Michael's fingering, and don't ye go straying into the treble part along a dick in his set, as ye did last year. And mind this especially when we be in Arise and Hail. Billy Chimlin, don't you sing quite so raving mad as you fain would. And all o' ye, whatever ye do, keep from making a great scuffle on the ground when we go in at people's gates.' but go quietly, so as to strike up all of a sudden like spirits. Farmer Ledlow's first. Farmer Ledlow's first, the rest as usual. And, Voss, said the tranter terminatively, you keep house here till about half-past two. Then heat the methaglin and cider in the warmer you'll find turned up upon the copper, and bring it with the victuals. To church hat, just this no. Just before the clock struck twelve, they lighted the lanterns and started. The moon in her third quarter had risen since the snowstorm, but the dense accumulation of snow cloud weakened her power to a faint twilight, which was rather pervasive of the landscape than traceable to the sky. The breeze had gone down, and the rustle of their feet and tones of their speech echoed with an alert rebound from every post, boundary stone, and ancient wall they passed, even where the distance of the echo's origin was less than a few yards. Beyond their own slight noises, nothing was to be heard save the occasional bark of foxes in the direction of Yalbury Wood, or the brush of a rabbit among the grass now and then as it scampered out of their way. Most of the outlying homesteads and hamlets had been visited by about two o'clock. They then passed across the outskirts of a wooded park toward the main village, nobody being at home at the manor. Pursuing no recognised track, great care was necessary in walking, lest their faces should come in contact with the low-hanging boughs of the old lime trees, which in many spots formed dense overgrowths of interlaced branches. "'Times have changed from the time they used to be,' said Mail, regarding nobody can tell what interesting old panoramas within an inward eye, and letting his outward glance rest on the ground, because it was as convenient a position as any. "'People don't care much about us now. I've been thinking we must be almost the last left in the county of the old string players.' Barrel organs and the things next door to em that you blow with your foot have come in terribly of late years. Aye, said Bowman, shaking his head, and old William on seeing him did the same thing. More's the pity, replied another. Time was long and merry ago now, when not one of the varmints was to be heard of, but it served some of the choirs right. They should have stuck to strings as we did, and kept out clarinets and done away with serpents. If you'd thrive in musical religion, stick to strings, say I. Strings be safe soul lifters as far as that do go, said Mr. Spinks. Yet there's worse things than serpents, said Mr. Penny. Old things pass away, tis true. But a serpent was a good old note. A deep, rich note was the serpent. Clarinets, however, be bad at all times, said Michael Mail. One Christmas, years ago now, years, I went the round with a Weatherbury choir. It was a hard, frosty night, and the keys of all the clarinets froze. Ah, they did freeze. 
so that 'twas like drawing a cork every time a key was opened, and the players of em had to go into a hedger and ditcher's chimney corner and thaw their clarinets every now and then. An icicle a spit hung down from the end of every man's clarinet a span long, and as to fingers, well there, if you'll believe me, we had no fingers at all to our knowing. I can well bring back to my mind, said Mr. Penny, what I said to poor Joseph Rhyme, who took the treble part in Chalk Newton Church for two and forty year, when they thought of having clarinets there. Joseph, I said, says I, depend upon it. If so be you have them tootin' clarinets, you'll spoil the whole set out. Clarinets were not made for the service of the Lord. You can see it by looking at em, I said. And what came out? Why, souls, the parson set up a barrel organ on his own account within two years of the time I spoke, and the old choir went to nothing. As far as luck is concerned, said the tranter, I don't for my part see that a fiddle is much nearer heaven than a clarinet. "'Tis further off. "'There's always a rakish, scampish twist about a fiddle's look "'that seems to say the wicked one had a hand in making of em, "'while angels be supposed to play clarinets in heaven "'or summat like em, if ye may believe pictures.' "'Robert Penny, you was in the right,' broke in the eldest Dewey. "'They should have stuck to strings. "'Your brass man is a rafting dog well and good your reed man is a dab at stirring ye well and good your drum man is a rare bowel shaker good again but i don't care who hears me say nothing will speak to your heart with the sweetness of the man of strings strings forever said little jimmy Strings alone would have held their ground against all the newcomers in creation. True, true, said Bowman, but clarinets was death. Death they was, said Mr. Penny. And harmoniums, William continued in a louder voice, and getting excited by these signs of approval, harmoniums and barrel organs, ah, and groans from Spinks. Be miserable. What shall I call them? Miserable sinners, suggested Jimmy, who made large strides like the men, and did not lag behind like the other little boys. Miserable Dumbledores. Right, William, and so they be. Miserable Dumbledores, said the choir with unanimity. By this time they were crossing to a gate in the direction of the school, which, standing on a slight eminence at the junction of three ways, now rose in unvarying and dark flatness against the sky. The instruments were retuned, and all the band entered the school enclosure, enjoined by old William to keep upon the grass. Number 78 he softly gave out, as they formed round in a semicircle, the boys opening the lanterns to get a clearer light, and directing their rays on the books. Then passed forth into the quiet night an ancient and time-worn hymn, embodying a quaint Christianity in words orally transmitted from father to son through several generations, down to the present characters who sang them out right earnestly. Remember Adam's fall, O thou man, O thou man. Remember Adam's fall from heaven to hell. Remember Adam's fall, how he hath condemned all in hell perpetual therefore to dwell remember god's goodness o thou man o thou man remember god's goodness his promise made 
Bethlehem he was born, O thou man, O thou man, in Bethlehem he was born for mankind's sake. In Bethlehem he was born Christmas Day in the morn. Our Saviour thought no scorn our faults to take. Give thanks to God alway, O thou man, O thou man. Give thanks to God alway with heart most joy. Give thanks to God alway on this our joyful day. Let all men sing and say, Holy, Holy. Having concluded the last note, they listened for a minute or two, but found that no sound issued from the schoolhouse. Four breaths and then, oh, what unbounded goodness, number 59, said William. This was duly gone through, and no notice whatever seemed to be taken of the performance. Good guide us! Surely tisn't a empty house as befell us in the year thirty-nine and forty-three, said old Dewey. Perhaps she's just come from some musical city and sneers at our doings, the tranter whispered. Odd rabbit her, said Mr. Penny with an annihilating look at a corner of the school chimney. I don't quite stomach her if this is it. Your plain music, well done, is as worthy as your other sort, done bad, I believe, souls. So say I. Four breaths, and then the last, said the leader authoritatively. Rejoice, ye tenants of the earth, number sixty-four. At the close, waiting yet another minute, he said in a clear, loud voice, as he had said in the village at that hour and season for the previous forty years, a Merry Christmas to ye. End of section four. Recording by Rachel Linton, Bristol, UK. Carol, sung by Ruth Golding.